I've been making YouTube videos for over 10 years. Hey guys, it's that snazzy iPhone guy and I'm gonna drop my iPhone off the roof in Scipio Tribal. This is drop test number one. Yeah, so most of them have been crap, but I've been making them. The bad thing is, is that I don't have any local archive of the footage I've shot over the last decade. I produce so many videos that backing up most of the footage has been both a logistical and financial impossibility. Up until today, I've imported my captured footage onto Samsung T5 external SSDs. They're fast, they're reliable, and they work great. But once a video is completed, I have to delete all my footage and start from scratch. This method is clearly awful for a number of obvious reasons. Number one, there's no redundancy. So if I lose or corrupt an SSD, which is rare, but has happened before, everything is gone and I have to reshoot the entire video. Number two, when I need to reuse some of my old footage because I'm referencing a previous video, which actually now happens pretty frequently, I need to re-download my own video from YouTube. The quality of the rip sections is noticeably worse than the rest of the new video, and I can't easily modify the cuts or the color. It, just, it seldom looks professional. And number three, I have an employee now. This is Derek. And at Snazzy Labs, it's pertinent that both ongoing and past projects be easily accessible at any time by anyone on their own machines. So we fixed this problem by building a 336 terabyte server on a really tight budget. We've named her Margaret in memoriam of my dead Discord server. And Margaret is, <laughs> she's absolutely insane. This video is sponsored by Seagate's Iron Wolf Pro hard drives with capacities up to 14 terabytes, a five-year warranty, and designed for pro users in extremely stressing environments, there's no better choice. Pick up your hard drives today with the link below. This project had a few very specific requirements. Price, a couple of YouTubers are using the LumaForge Jellyfish servers, and they're cool in that they're plug and play, but at the price of a down payment on a house, it was way out of budget for me. Speed. I could have gotten a relatively inexpensive off-the-shelf NAS, but due to weak system specs, they're way too slow to edit off of directly, and so you have to do manual backups overnight. I've, I've tried these before, and it's just not worth the hassle, especially with multiple editors. Reliability. The last thing I want to do is constantly deal with problems. I need hardware designed to run 24-7. Believe it or not, there's hardware that meets all of these requirements quite nicely, and that's old enterprise gear. It's designed for reliability and speed, and since data centers are always on the cutting edge buying new hardware, the used market gets flooded with actually really respectable hardware on the cheap after just a couple of years. I have to give a shout out to Wendell from Level 1 Techs. He's been invaluable in this process and has helped me select the hardware that I need uh, and basically walked me through the entire software process since I'm such a networking noob. Definitely check out his Level 1 News show that happens at least a couple times per week. It's super informative and entertaining. Thanks, Wendell. Okay, so excluding the hard drives, this kit would have cost north of $30,000 when it was new about five to 10 years ago. I bought everything you see here for less than $2,600 excluding drives. And even though the hardware is a little bit older at this point, it's still crazy powerful. Let me walk you through what I purchased and why I went with it. Okay, everything's turned off because this server is anything but quiet. <laughs> We're gonna keep it out here in the shop. But the lifeblood of the system is the HP Proleon Generation 8 server. This thing is easily serviceable if something ever goes wrong. You just slide it out on its rails, and with proprietary but plentiful replacement parts, like these cool one-click fans, expendable parts are easy to swap out. It's rocking two Intel Xeon Ivy Bridge 8-core CPUs clocked at 3.3 gigahertz each. That gives us a total of 16 cores on the system, and it's also rocking 128 gigabytes of DDR3 ECC RAM. Why so much RAM? Well, for one, it's cheap, but caching. It's one of the reasons that this server is so fast, and I'll explain that in more detail in just a minute. The server also has redundant power supplies and two PCIe cards. One of them is the Host Bus Adapter, or HBA. This card communicates with the NetApp DS4246, this little box that we have below the server. Inside this very simple box is all 24 of our hard drives. 
they plug into a shared backplane, basically a PCB, and they communicate with the main server over special and expensive QSFP Plus to mini SAS cables. But what about the drives, you ask? Oh, baby. Our friends at Seagate hooked us up with 24 of their Iron Wolf Pro NAS hard drives with capacities of 14 terabytes per drive. That means we have 336 terabytes of potential storage at our fingertips. The drives you choose in a server build, whether it be a huge project like ours or a smaller NAS for your home, are actually really important. And Seagate's Iron Wolf Pro series has a stellar reputation and are specifically designed to be used in multi-drive arrays with long uptimes, high vibrations, extremely high rewrites, and they're warranted for five years, with two years of that being covered by their rescue recovery data plan. Uh, it's included free, and so in case there's ever accidental data loss, they'll recover it. I've used multiple Iron Wolf Pro drives over the years, and I can't recommend them highly enough. I'll leave purchase links down below if you're interested. The only other PCIe card left on the server is the Network Interface card, or NIC, and it provides about 20 gigabit Ethernet of throughput to this amazing Arista network switch. This switch has 48 10 gigabit Ethernet RJ45 ports, not single gigabit, 10 gigabit ports, 48 of them, to service my whole office, as well as four QSFP Plus ports that handle 40 gigabit connections. It is insane that these things are available on eBay for around $400. And if you want to equip your entire home with 10 gigabit Ethernet LAN on the cheap, this switch is a superb option. The weak point of the system is absolutely the network interface card, the NIC. It can probably only support three simultaneous editors, which I don't yet have, so it's not that big of a problem. But if and when I need the overhead, I could upgrade to a different card for four to $500 that will provide more than enough bandwidth to support more editors. All of this slick hardware is plugged into an APC 1500 watt battery backup solution. It'll protect us from brownouts, and it also communicates with the server in case of extended power loss. It can only power everything for about 60 seconds, but that's more than enough time for the server and everything else to automatically shut down. Okay, so we've talked about the hardware, but what about the operating system? Well, depending on who you ask, you're going to get a different answer on the best method. The most common options, however, at least for video editing, are Unraid, which is easy to use paid software, and FreeNAS, which is open source, built on the FreeBSD Unix-like OS. And typically nets much higher performance than Unraid, but at the cost of a more difficult and involved initial setup. I chose FreeNAS. Now, FreeNAS uses the Z file system, or ZFS. A file system basically controls how data is stored on and retrieved from a disk. Now, the reason that FreeNAS is so fast, and the reason that I have so much RAM, is something that I mentioned earlier, caching. Okay, this gets a little complicated, but hang in there with me. I'm gonna try and explain it the best I can. When data is received from a client computer, so in my case, the iMac Pro I edit videos on, a few seconds of data is buffered in the HP server's RAM until it can be quickly offloaded to the ZFS's write cache, which is called the ZIL. Now, the ZIL is basically just a short-term holding location to get the information out of volatile memory, aka the server's RAM, but to give the data safe harbor until it can be properly spread across the pool, or array of hard disks, with proper redundancy. Now, some servers would use an NVMe SSD that can handle high frequency but small size data writes. My system, however, it has so many hard drives that the bottleneck is actually the 10 gigabit ethernet connection from my iMac. So my system without any SSDs in theory could be a bit weak for random writes and reads since mechanical hard drives aren't best known for their IOPS, their raw data throughput speed. But in my case of using larger video files, it really doesn't matter. So most of the server's RAM is consumed not by the write cache I just explained, but by the read cache. Now this is known as the adaptive replacement cache or ARC. And ideally it's mostly done in RAM. Now if you don't have enough RAM, you can add an SSD, a fast one, as a level two ARC. But the more RAM that you have, the more data you can cache. And the larger your cache, the more responsive your server will feel since you're not requesting data over and over and over from the spinning hard drives. Now I've got 128 gigabytes, and in my limited testing, I think it's enough for my needs, but I've also got double the RAM slots available, so I could, in theory, upgrade this system to 256 gigs of system memory for about $200 more. I might do it anyways, because that's just insane. <laughs> Margaret is configured to have a pool that contains three VDEVs of eight disks each. 
With RAID Z2, I have a two disk redundancy per VDEV. So I can have two drive failures at any given time on one VDEV. The end result, well, it's a server with over 208 terabytes of usable storage. I can edit in Final Cut Pro and DaVinci Resolve directly off the server with the full res Canon RAW footage that I'm shooting in. No proxy footage is required. That's because the server can saturate my iMac Pro's 10 gigabit ethernet connection at more than two times the speed of the Samsung T5 SSDs I was using before. Pretty good for a server with no SSDs, I'd say. <laughs> Okay, so logistically speaking, there's two of us. My iMac Pro has a 10 gigabit ethernet port built in. And until the new Mac Pro is released later this year, I'm going to continue using my 5K Retina iMac that I upgraded in one of my videos a couple years ago. It's still a killer system, but it doesn't have 10 gig ethernet support. That's not too big of a problem though, because since the machine is equipped with Thunderbolt 3, I can either buy an adapter on Amazon for a couple hundred bucks, or just use an existing PCIe 10 gig network card that I have through a Thunderbolt 3 dock. That way, both my editor and I can simultaneously access the server and get speeds of nearly one gigabyte per second back and forth without Margaret breaking a sweat. That's freaking cool. Margaret is a killer system and I am so excited to finally be doing storage right. At our new goal of six videos per month, with my current gear, the available storage should last us roughly four years. <laughs> At that point, I could easily add another disk shelf full of hard drives, or I could just start offloading our really old footage onto LTO magnetic tapes. But that is quite literally a problem for years down the road. In the meantime, Margaret's here to stay. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, that other button seems to work okay too. Get subscribed for more awesome tech videos like these, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.